to start, um, maybe you can give me uh, just a very quick intro to yourself and like what you were doing before Payload, how Payload came about, that kind of thing. Sure. Well, first, thanks for having me. Um, I'm excited. Uh, I have been a full stack developer for about 12 years. Um, I started teaching myself in college because I had some clients come to me from a print shop. I was also kind of a graphic designer playing around with like Illustrator and Photoshop <clears throat> back when those were okay. cool. And uh, I had some clients come to me asking for websites. And back in the day, it was PHP and it was WordPress and all this stuff. And uh, I just taught myself out of necessity. But then I got a um, front-end developer position at a, an e-commerce firm in Chicago. So I packed everything up and moved down to Chicago. I was a front-end developer there for three years and it was amazing. It was your typical like startup culture, awesome company. Um, I met a lot of friends there, learned a lot about code, especially at scale. And then after that, I started my own digital design firm called Trouble, T-R-B-L. Okay. That's a pun, um, a CSS pun, top right bottom. Okay, went right over my head. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it does to a lot of people, but I like the fact that it might ring true with some CSS-friendly people, and they're like, oh, that's mm-hmm. clever. So um, yeah, for yeah. Sure. it's not trouble for sure. But um, in the agency setting, over the last seven years or so, I've built just about every type of project from SaaS apps to just full-blown e-commerce web apps, enterprise websites. We actually did the Klarna.com website um, a couple of years ago and that we used WordPress. But my entire career, I've seen technology change so frequently. And when React came on the scene and all of these front-end boilerplates and front-end libraries that make a front-end job easier, um, no CMS worked well with these newer, fancier front-end libraries. And I wanted to use React. My team wanted to use React. And we wanted to break away from having to install a PHP CMS, but then you still have to maintain a Node Modules folder anyways. So it's like, even if you want to work in PHP, you're still going to have NPM somewhere, the Node ecosystem somewhere. And uh, we scoured the market. We looked around for years um, to see if there was a JavaScript content management system and kind of twofold. It had to be JavaScript and it also had to be headless because that would let us use React. And we looked around and tried a lot of stuff, but never could find anything that had kind of the silver bullet solution aspect to it. So I roped in a couple of my buddies from high school that are also full stack developers. And in 2018, we started building Payload and uh, that's forward and here we are. Yeah, and there's there's two um, you know you've had two big uh, pieces of news happen this this month, which we'll get to in a moment. Well, the most recent one, which we'll start with, is obviously um, going totally uh, free and open source. So, what were the driving sort of decisions? What, what drove that decision, and you know where, where do you see that sort of uh, taking you guys? Well, so having a piece of software like Payload and being able to be meticulous about the UI and just really sink my heart and soul into a product has been a lifelong dream of mine. And the CMS is a very good application of mine and my team's skill because we're subjected to it all the time. As full stack devs, we use them all the time. Yeah. And um, when we launched, we wanted to make this into a business that we could invest ourselves into fully. And we wanted to make a revenue model that was fair and that was transparent, but that would also scale and allow us to build a team around it. But when we launched in January, 2021, we got great reception. Every developer that used Payload loved it. Um, but we kept hearing over and over that a self-hosted tool like Payload, you put it on your own server, that should be open source. That should be free. There should be no license involved. I mean, if Linux is open source, and if a self-hosted kind of ecosystem is all built on open source tools, then Payload should be open source. And honestly, We've gotten so many contributions and feature requests and feature implementations from our community over the past year and a half that like it doesn't feel right to be working with the community so closely and having them so openly contribute, but we still charge money for licenses for more than one person to use. And so we decided to make a shift to open source based on our community and based on um, our own embracing of open source software. 
Okay, cool. How about like for the enterprise market or like just larger companies using payload? Is that going to extend to them? Is it going to be like a different type of plan for them? Yeah, you know, what's funny about enterprise customers is that we've also heard from them that an open source license is often easier for a large organization to adopt because you okay. can just totally bypass any type of proprietary licensing, any legal kind of bureaucratic structure that you have to go through. And making an open source core product means that they're easier, they're, they're more easily able to adopt the software internally. So okay. it does help our um, enterprise adoption as well. But we already have all kinds of enterprises that are talking to us about adopting payload, uh, mostly based on the features, but they also do see the value in that coming open source. Okay, interesting. So this kind of gives us a little segue into, into my second question, which is, you know, Payload introduces itself as a you know, developer-first platform. So why don't you just talk about, you know, what that means, first and foremost, you know, how exactly do you, do you sort of go about being and staying developer-first, especially when, from my perspective, you know, there's a lot of push and, you know, demand maybe for sort of a market-friendly UI, UX, that kind of thing going into sort of, again, more enterprise space or just larger companies. How do you balance that? How do you, what, what, what's, what's driving you to stay developer-first and how do you stay that way? Oh, I have so many thoughts. So many Go for it. Thoughts. Go for it. Number one, the no-code movement like Wix, Squarespace, even WordPress themes. A long time ago, I had to make peace with that as a designer. And as an agency founder that we sell websites, mm -hmm. like I'd have you know restaurants come to me and I'd have friends and family that want to have their plumbing business have a website or whatever. And I had to figure out a way to navigate the fact that I don't want to build Squarespace websites for clients. Like they don't need anything more than a Squarespace website or a no code tool. But where does that leave me and my company? If I'm sending all of this business to these no code tools, how do I build a sustainable business as a web developer that cares about code? And what tools do I use? I don't want to learn how to use Squarespace. I don't want to learn how to install 16 WordPress plugins to cobble together something that I don't fully understand how it works. So where is my market? And how do I make peace with this smaller market that still exists? Small in terms of customer size, not necessarily market yeah. attention. Yeah. And I think the reason is that not everyone needs a fully developed solution from code, but many people do. And oftentimes the people that do need a code-based solution are the ones that they have a mission critical piece of infrastructure that they need to build. And they can't cobble it together. Cobbling something together with a WordPress theme or with like a no-code tool that even like an app builder no-code tool, that's totally fine for a lot of companies, especially MVP products. But at a certain point, you need to know how your software works and you need to architect it so that it scales and so that it's extensible and so that you can work on it with a team of developers and a team of people that are responsible for new features and implementations and I've, I'm a firm believer that we're nowhere near no code tools being able to sorry, dog, nice. replace what a team of developers can do. Even things like yeah. GitHub code that are automating development. I mean, those yeah. are great tools, but you still need to have development um, happen. And I like writing code. Personally, I find it fascinating. Like, I'm half a developer, half a designer. And I've seen my career kind of switch from user experience design that really fires me up in the morning over to like architecture and engineering and clean solutions and scalable solutions. And I want to build stuff that I fully understand, that I can version control, that I can be proud of. And um, I think a lot of people share my interest. And so that's why I'm a big believer in a developer first tool that embraces code rather than runs from it. Okay, fair enough. You were mentioning to me before we jumped on um, things like avoiding uh, feature ceilings and sort of having your your CMS, um, you know, GitHub repository as, uh, as code. Are these kind of things that are still still sort of um, really relevant to you. Totally. So, over my agency experience, um, we've used just about every headless CMS out there, and a lot of them abstract away certain functionality from you as a developer. And you might hit a feature just roadblock. Like, I need to build this one thing. And there is literally no way that I can do this with the, ex the existing CRUD, free read, update, delete, that this headless CMS gives me. So guess what I got to do? I got to go stand up a node server or a Lambda function somewhere and then build in custom functionality still completely outside of the headless CMS. 
And so now I have this CMS that I was hoping would manage my content, but now I need to maintain a server over here as well. Or something like authentication. If you use a headless CMS that's mainly just for content, and all of a sudden you need authentication, bam, there's another service. You need to sign up for it, another subscription yeah. per month. And you might still need your own node endpoints somewhere, or your own GraphQL mutations or queries. And I've just seen over the course of um, my digital agency that we have never found a tool that allowed us to truly build whatever we needed to build. And this is kind of like a high-level concept that I'm wondering how it will play out over time. But the headless CMS, in its essence, should really give you an extensible admin panel so that you don't need to build the interface to create, read, update, delete, and version control and all that. It should also give you endpoints. But it could give you a lot more than that. Like the traditional content full Prismic, they're for writing and reading content. But, yeah. And that's what a lot of people think of a headless CMS as, content management system, write and read content, and that's it. But I feel like there's a lot more potential in the headless CMS world to actually border on an application framework. So, yeah. for example, if you have like an orders collection or like a requests, um, I'll tell you about a project that we built recently. Um, you have to manage these requests in a CMS. That's, that's content. You have to manage user accounts and you have to manage their document uploads. Like, you know, they might have proof of insurance for like a service provider. They might have a profile photo. That's all content that needs to be managed, but it's used in a full blown app environment on the front end. So you're managing content, but you're also powering a full app. Yeah. You should be able to build in your own business logic into these content management systems so that when a user gets created, you might send off an email or you might right. sync it over to spot or you might um, alert an admin that says, I have got to go review that profile and approve them because they want to do something or something. Okay. You can see that there's like, like a central admin panel that's necessary sure. to exist, but there's a lot more that you could think of a headless CMS as. And so I feel like there's going to be a shift in the future. And I hope payload leads that charge of like being able to think about a CMS as more than just creating and reading and writing and deleting content. I think in the future, it will be thought of as borderline application framework. And like my okay. agency has built some significant apps with payload and it saved us a bunch of time because it delivered us the admin panel. That's extensible. If we need to build our own field, we can plug in our own React component. We can add a view to the dashboard, but we can also extend the API routes. And we can add in little hooks to fire off JavaScript functions to do things mm -hmm. all alongside of managing the content itself. And okay. so I think there's going to be a paradigm shift or some new word that comes out to describe the transition from headless CMS to application framework. It's not Laravel. Right. It's, not, it's not Ruby on Rails. It's a CMS, but it's also got a lot of what Laravel and Ruby on Rails has. You know what I'm right. saying? Yeah. How, how, where do you draw the line between just like, you know, building functionality that becomes plugins at that point? They're just like, you know, you're having these plugins. Is that, is that you know, part of the plan? Is it, do you, you seem to sort of share my, my hate for plugins. I, I'm a long, long term WordPress user, but maybe you don't. I don't know. Where, is that, where is that line drawn? Is it just about balancing it? How does that, how does that work? So plugins are always going to have a place in any type of this tool or ecosystem. Um, the, the, the difference is how well you can isolate their functionality and keep them secure and yeah. not introduce additional vulnerabilities through code and reduce the amount of version conflicts that you can have from plugin to plugin. Um, over time, I think we've seen, I think the big problem with the WordPress plugin ecosystem is that WordPress is classically blogging software. And I mean, I've used it to make a lot of money before and I respect it. And it's helped me in my career as a developer, but it was never made to be an e-commerce platform. All True. the content, WordPress and CMS is saved in two tables, posts and post meta. And post meta yeah. is just a big table that has keys and values and that's it. That's not a database. That's not meant for anything more than writing posts, assigning post meta and assigning post content, right? Yeah. So plugins come into to WordPress and the ecosystem gets blown out because they're used to extend in such deep intrinsic ways that it creates problems. Well, for example, payload, one of the things that I really like about our plugin implementation is that 
payload is config based. So everything that you do, you just write out a config and it's a file that you can check into your repo. But um, with payload plugins, all you do is you just take in the user's config, you inject your own functionality into their config, and then you send out another config. And then the next plugin can take that config in, inject their own functionality, and then send it out. So it's very predictable and it's very scalable. Mm -hmm. And as a developer, if you want to write plugins or if you want to even extend the plugin that you found, it makes sense. You can just open it up and you can read the source code. And it's not like you have to learn the intricacies of the platform and what the platform is capable of doing. You can just read the plugin and you know what it does. So it's a lot more predictable and trustworthy. Um, we are going to have a plugin market on this. My team um, has got five or six plugins that are um, almost ready to start sharing like for example, we have a redirection engine plugin. So like whenever you launch a new website or you migrate to a new CMS, your URL structures might change and you don't want to lose your SEO value from your old website to your new website. So you should write redirects to handle all the traffic that's hitting the old URLs and send it to the new URLs. But that's a perfect example for what a plugin can do in payload. You just install yeah. a redirect plugin, boom, you get a redirects collection. You, you say the from URL and you say the to URL, choose what type of redirect, 301, 308, whatever. And uh, boom, you're done. Yeah. Uh, another one would be like, oh, go Good. Ahead. No, 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 sorry. I interrupted you. Uh, no, the other, the other ones might be like, um, like a form builder where it's like a, you can build forms based on different field types. And then you can configure emails to be sent and like actions to be sent when a form is submitted. Okay. Uh, but it's all just payload. Like it's just yeah. it adds collections that give you the right fields, give you right hooks to send emails, and then you can use those forms on your front end wherever you want. Render it in React, do whatever you want. But it's all coming from the CMS. So lots of good stuff. Lots of good plugins coming out soon. Excellent. Well, that's good. And and uh, you know you I think payload is now off the top of my head like the fourth um, CMS I know that's either just launched or about to launch a, a plugin marketplace. Uh, which you know goes in line with what you're saying. In line with what you're saying, you know, the head of CMS is slowly becoming, you know, entire frameworks, um, and it feels like we've sort of we are evolving as an industry away from uh, because you mentioned their names, the the content falls and the prismics are just you know read write very you know I call them pure headless CMSs, right? Very very, very uh, uh, pure in what they do. Uh, we are moving towards this sort of more complex. Okay, we've got um, lots of options to extend functionality, that kind of thing. So yeah, definitely feels like it's heading, heading that way for sure. Um, in terms of the other piece of good news that you had this month, um, of course, uh, you were accepted into uh, Y Combinator, which is good news, congratulations. Um, with that in mind, what's the strategy for, for sort of growth this year and beyond? What's, uh, what's next for Payload? So when we, before we released our transition to open source, it was hard to share on places like Reddit or like get community buy-in because we were charging right. money for the product. But like, <clears throat> I look at something like Next.js and I love what Next and Vercel are doing. I think that model is beautiful. It's mm -hmm. a trusted open source tool that, hey, you can download it and you can host it wherever you want. You can put it on your own server. You can put it on your own intranet. It doesn't even need to face the external web. And you are in complete control. But it just so happens to be the best way to deploy a Next.js app in my opinion, is Vercel. Because you get to leverage a GitHub integration, automatic deploys, branch-based previews, all the good stuff that Vercel gives you. And um, I think that's where we're going to go with Payload. Like, okay. all, the, the main product is going to be the next JS, the open source, put it wherever you want, get developer adoption. Um, and then we're going to build like a cloud deployment platform with our YC investment, and we're going to be raising seed round soon. Um, okay. We're going to be able to connect to a GitHub repo, that'll be all your code. But it'll just deploy when you push to a branch. It'll give you a Mongo database. It'll give you permanent file storage on like S3 or something like that. And it'll give you API endpoints um, all automatically. And uh, that's how we're going to monetize. And that's how we're going to, that's our strategy for the long term. But payload will always be free, completely MIT. And um, just like Next.js. Okay. Interesting. That really is interesting, actually. I'm going to definitely dive into just refresh my memory of the, the whole model and, and just trying to plot where you're going to go just for my own, my own interests. That's really interesting. Okay, cool. Um, you mentioned before as well, you had, you had um, your agency has built some really cool uh, projects uh, using Payload. I was wondering what's, um, you know, any standout projects you guys, any case studies that are really interesting that you built over the years? Oh, yeah. I mean, outside of just my agency, people are building things all around the world with Payload that blow me away. Like with the Ukraine conflict, 
we've seen multiple um, initiatives come out using payload to help Ukrainians leave the country. We've seen help Ukrainians find new jobs in other bordering countries, all built on payload, like significant apps to help the relocation of Ukrainian refugees, which I feel is really, really cool and helpful to me. Um, so pe and people are doing that type of thing all over the world with payload, much more than just managing content for websites. But my own agency, um, we built this app called Quick Plow back in, um, okay. I'd say it was September to December of 2021. Okay. And Quickplow is basically Uber for snowplows. So I'm in Grand Rapids, Michigan. It's very snowy. Waking up in the morning and having to be 10 degrees, you have to go outside and snow blow your driveway. That, um, that sucks. So if you don't want to do that, you can just download the Quickplow app. And it's a native app. And you can order somebody to come and plow your driveway, just like you would order an Uber. And it's all crowdsourced. And service providers sign up. They have ratings and they have... Um, okay qualification process they've got to upload insurance and everything but you can you can just create a request it'll get matched to the nearest driver they'll come out and apply your driveway and that was all built on payload so that's okay. a perfect example of like how i mean it's a cms the admins of the quick file business use payloads ui to manage the entire business it's like a back office right like wow. they log in they approve service provider requests they see the requests that come in from customers they can use the payload UI to be able to administer. Like if a customer has a problem, they can log in, pull up the customer's um, request. They'll see what the service provider is. They'll contact the service provider if they need to. But they use the admin UI of payload significantly to make sure that the business operates well. And if we had to build all that from scratch, my agency, when we built QuickPlow, we would have had to build a very, very complex React Native app and then we would have had to build a very, very complex admin dashboard to let yeah. them monitor and manage the business. Not, not to mention the authentication, the email delivery, the email service, notifications, um, all the API endpoints and everything, the security, the access control. Payload gave all of that to us. And so for QuickPod, we literally built that entire app. You can check it out. It's like we, we turned it around in three months. But if we didn't have Payload to do that, it would have easily taken six months. No question about it especially given the amount of features that we were able to give the admins of QuickPlow right out of the gate with the admin UI. Mm -hmm. So that was a cool one. Um, obviously, there are enterprise websites that we're building with Payload that have you know all those plugins that I mentioned, form builders, redirect engines, SEO yeah. plugins, parent page, hierarchies, stuff like that. Um, but we also built a sign engine, like a sign okay. design engine. So, like, imagine if you're in a big skyscraper and you every floor has, like, an elevator sign and sure. every hallway has wayfinding signs and they all look the same. They're all branded the same, but they all have different words on them and they have different constructions, but it's all of a system. We built a sign designer on top of Payload that lets someone log in. The front end is a web app in React, and uh, they can design and build their own sign system, and then they can even pay for it through a Stripe integration. But all of that is powered on the back end with payload. And again, if we didn't have payload, that would have taken twice as long to build. Um, that one, the team at Trouble did some wizardry with the sign rendering. It's all awesome. cool. It's it's like, cool. Yeah, I like the sign one. That sounds really interesting to me. Um, if there's somebody listening to this and they're wondering, you know, if payload is for them, who who is payload not for? Who who is the 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 type of company or the type of start type of startup? who probably should avoid using payload? Uh, if you have maybe 30 developers on a project and you're building something like just incredibly complex, mission critical for a big organization and you have the funding and the bandwidth to build it from scratch, you probably don't need to use payload. You might even be more inclined to go with more of an application framework like uh, Redwood JS or any of those because those are going to be full, like just build whatever you want. And you don't get an admin panel. You don't get automatic REST API or GraphQL or anything. But you might want to build that yourself, right? Mm -hmm. So there is an upper limit, but that limit is pretty high up there. So like given the complexity of those two products that I just named, those things can handle thousands of requests per minute. And it's totally fine. Um, and we were able to do it in a very scrappy way. Like we didn't charge them a million dollars to build either of those apps. But if you have a budget of a million dollars, ten million dollars, whatever, you might you might as well just build it from scratch with your team. 
Right. But um, one thing that I am a big believer in and something that I always struggled in when I was learning as a developer was I hated the fact that when you pick a new framework or a new technology, you have to learn the technology's way of doing things. Like you have to take a crash course on how that tool works before you can get productive at all. And you're not yeah. writing the code that you're using. You're writing that CMS language. So like WordPress, their infrastructure built on um, hooks and like their functions.php file, WP config, the way the plugins are mounted, the way the themes are created, header.php, footer.php, all that stuff. All of that is specific to WordPress. And I never was a big fan of that because you're only learning WordPress. You're not learning PHP. Yeah. You're yeah. Learning WordPress. And a lot of fun, um, frameworks are exactly like that. Um, and so we had a huge focus when we built Payload to make it so that whenever you write Payload code, you are just writing JavaScript. If you know how the spread operator works, if you know how to write a function, if you know how to return things out of a function, that's all you need to do for Payload. It's all just JavaScript and TypeScript. That's it. And um, for that reason, I think our audience for Payload is developers. Any developer, if it's a portfolio website that you want to put your projects in, you as a developer, a solo dev, you're the perfect candidate for payload. But it ranges. It's kind of like a bottom-up approach that we're doing. We want to get as much exposure as we can. We want to get adoption. We want to get feedback. We want to build something that provides value to developers. Mm -hmm. And we're going to have that adoption be from the solo devs all over the world. But then the solo devs will see the value that we provide and then implement payload in larger, more complex products for digital agencies, enterprises, bigger websites, anything you can think of. So it's kind of like a bottom-up approach. Yeah, makes sense. Okay, interesting. Cool. Um, now, my last question, and maybe, maybe we've touched on it with the whole sort of moving towards application framework uh, type of thing. But if there was one thing you could change about the headless CMS industry, it could be from a technological perspective, it could be from like a, uh, a messaging and you know, kind of messaging perspective, what would that be? What, what would you change about the space if you could? Well, number one, the customization of the products because like my agency is very concerned with deliberate design. Everything that we do is going to be a deliberately designed product. And even a website is going to have like different heroes that you can choose from. Then you'll be able to choose from layout building blocks to build the content of the page. Then you'll be able to design a mega, a mega menu system. So you can craft mega menus with columns and icons and whatever you want. And you can have like nested pages and everything. And like we design things from scratch. So we should be able to build to suit our from scratch design intent. And I've always hit limitations with other platforms like that. Something as simple as like, imagine you're in a CMS and you say enable button. And there's a checkbox. It's a field. It's a checkbox. When you check that button, you want to have six other fields pop up to be able to style the button, to be able to dial on the button, label the URL, open a new tab. But you don't want those four fields to show unless they click that enable CTA button. That's called conditional logic. And classically, WordPress and advanced custom fields, they did that very, very well. And that's just completely missing from every headless CMS besides using WordPress and ACF. Like, you name it, the headless CMS doesn't have it. It's incredibly hard to build that too. But payload features that. So that's a huge pet peeve of mine. Like, if you want to give your admins a nice interface... And you don't want to just put out 35 fields, even if they're not relevant, you, you're screwed. You have to, yeah. you can't do it. And so I feel like there's a huge piece of the headless CMS market that um, just doesn't give developers a way to truly design an interface that allows content generation to be easy. But um, another aspect of where I think the headless market is right now is like the idea of a headless CMS is. It doesn't have any control over your interface at all, right? It doesn't impose what technology you use. It doesn't impose that you only have to use it for one website. You can use the same content for a native app, for a VR app, whatever you want. But we're still seeing this way of trying to preview, live preview with a headless yeah. CMS. Yes. And I think there's a lot of value in that. And I think that the market needs that. But I don't think we're there yet. Because even like... Previewing a website. Is that really a headless CMS at that point? Because you have your front end and you have your back end. That's just the CMS that allows you to build wherever you want. But that's like traditional CMS, right? You can choose your language, but you're still kind of connecting the two at the hip. 
Yeah. And so I don't think we're there yet with the perfect way to preview data and also be a true headless CMS. Um, I've got some ideas. My team and I are working on some new um, UI options mm -hmm. for payload that will kind of be like a medium editor where you can kind of see your content and it's a really slick editing interface, but it's not okay. like a one to one representation of what it will look like. It's very Fine. close and it's, it's good enough to be able to preview your content. But I feel like developers should still have control over what the editor looks like and what the live looks like and not bind yeah. that to the hit. So right. I think there's a lot of room to improve there across the whole industry. Um, we're going to be yeah. pivoting to um, a lot of really cool ideas inside of payload, but I want to keep the isolation of concerns central to whatever payload does in the future. Amazing. Cool. That was a much better answer than I was, than I was, I was, I was I think I was going to get. So that's really great. Cool. Is there anything else that we didn't discuss um, that you think we should, that you think, you know, we just didn't touch on that you wanted to? Yeah, I would say like the notion of being developer first. Like to me as a developer, I really, really don't like when I install a new product or a project or, a, you know, whatever dependency and it just scaffolds everything for you in the back end, and you have no visibility into how it works. Right. Like what I want as a developer is to be able to understand my code and to write my code and to organize my code however I want to. You know, there might be some best practices, but I want to have a GitHub repo, and I want to have a clear version history or obviously commits and everything, and I want to be able to design my folder structures. I want to be able to write my own fields in JavaScript or TypeScript, and I want to understand that the, the CMS is going to abstract here, here, and here, but that's it. And then after that, I can build whatever I want, and I won't hit a feature ceiling, or I won't be locked into the vendor, right? So another thing that is kind of alarming to me in the industry right now is like a lot of tools will call themselves developer first, but they generate your code for you. And they just totally scaffold it out for you and it's barely readable. And to be able to modify it, you don't know what you're going to break if you add a function. You don't know what that's going to affect. And there's no way of you fully up being able to be confident about the code that you write. So like truly having a developer first platform means embrace code and make it clear and make it clean and make the documentation as robust as possible. Not only that, but make it clear because the product in itself shouldn't be that complicated. You should, it should be beautifully elegant and simple, but extremely powerful. And I think there's a lot of room in the industry to like truly be de developer first. And that's a big, a big concern of mine. When, whenever we build out a new feature for payload, it's like, okay, is this confusing? How does this play with everything else? Is there, are there going to be any gotchas when you implement this feature? Are you going to have to migrate your data? Like nobody wants to do any of that. It should just work. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's a huge focus of mine. It's an interesting. I just don't like when people say they're developer first, but truly the product is very confusing and hard to understand. Fine. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, great. James, if somebody wants to continue this conversation with you, where's the best place to reach you? Go to our website. We have a contact page on our footer. You can find my email there. You can go on GitHub. We have a lot of discussions happening now. Um, our issues are mainly reserved for bugs and um, broken aspects of payload. But our discussions are for getting help, for interacting with the community. And we also opened up a Discord server recently. Um, it's got a lot of payload developers in there. There's always constant chatter in there. It's a good place to get some help and talk with us. But um, yeah, the website, Discord, GitHub discussions, all good stuff. Amazing. Thank you so much for your time. I think it was a really, really interesting conversation for me, definitely. And hopefully, hopefully we'll have you back on again soon. Absolutely. I'd be happy to. Thanks for having me. Thanks, James.